As the November election approaches, Joe Biden and Donald Trump are pitching their diplomatic experience. In order to gain and regain the confidence of the world, we have to prove again that America says what it means and means what it says. I like bilateral better. I think it's better for our country. I think it's better for our workers. As Democrats advocate a return to multilateralism. When we coordinate our actions together, we have way more leverage uh, in peace and security and way more uh, leverage in geoeconomics than we do when we act alone as we have been. And President Trump's advisors continue to push an America first agenda. America first doesn't mean America alone. We feel that America's responsibility is to the American people first. While challenges between the U.S. and China's relationship continue to intensify. Right now we are in this kind of cold war. Join us for a Bloomberg special report, 2020 Year of Crisis, Diplomatic Divide. Hello and welcome, I'm Kevin Cirilli. There's an old saying in politics that foreign policy doesn't win elections. But as Joe Biden and Donald Trump enter the final stretch of the campaign, both men are pitching their diplomatic experience to voters. However, they're offering contrasting plans for the future of U.S. diplomacy. Richard Grinnell has served as President Trump's ambassador to Germany, as well as acting director of national intelligence and the special envoy for Serbia and Kosovo peace negotiations. The reality is, is that we have a fundamentally different worldview than Joe Biden. Joe Biden has, has the idea that America comes up with one policy position and we put it into the UN Security Council mixer or the European government mixer and it all gets blended up and watered down and it becomes the lowest common denominator of a policy. We don't view multilateralism like that. What we view is, is that we fight for American policy, what's best for American national security. And then we look for partners. We look for regional alliances. That doesn't mean that you have to go to the UN Security Council and allow them to water down your policy or go to the EU in Brussels and, and cut the policy in half, uh, you know, America versus the EU and we somehow meet uh, in a, in a watered-down version where nobody, uh, nobody agrees. That's the old way of looking at uh, consensus. And, and we, we feel that America's responsibility is to the American people first. And America alone doesn't mean, I mean, America first doesn't mean America alone. America first means that we take the uh, American people's safety and prosperity first, and then we try to form alliances around that. So we're going to remake regional alliances. Uh, the, the perfect uh, example is Nord Stream 2, where our Nord Stream 2 policy, uh, rejected by the German government, is actually celebrated by the European Parliament. And so we're going to work very hard to be multilateral with a strong U.S. foreign policy. I want to talk about China because just recently the World Trade Organization, something that President Trump has been increasingly critical of, has declared that some of the tariffs that have been imposed by the United States on China don't fall in line with WTO guidelines. How, how, how does the Trump administration deal with uh, global institutions like the WTO while also trying to take a more aggressive uh, stance with Beijing? So I would say a couple of points there, Kevin. One, um, look the example that the Trump administration has tried to use with the United Nations, which is some programs at the UN are very good, some are not. We're trying to get rid of the ones that are not. We believe that when you reform organizations, there's an argument to be made that you believe in those organizations rather than ignore them and let them become adrift. It's been 20 years since China has been uh, put into the WTO. When we originally envisioned China going into the WTO, we did it because we thought that in a couple of years, say four or five at the most, China would begin to act like uh, a Western style capitalistic country. They would at least move in that direction. And so we think that it's not too much to say that having the Chinese in the WTO has been a disaster. 
Uh, we, I don't think that they should be a part of the WTO. They've demonstrated over 20 years that they are not willing to move in the direction that, that uh, the WTO wants to, which is capitalism. And so uh, I think that we are going to create organizations like the, the new USMCA trade agreement where th there are provisions in there of problem solving outside of the WTO because we are admitting to the world that the WTO is failing. You know, and, and, and lastly, uh, Middle East front and center. We've seen the role that Israel has played uh, in normalizing relations with uh, now two Gulf Arab states. And then, of course, the recent developments that you, of course, sir, were front and center for with regards to Kosovo and Serbia. Israel playing a key role in that uh, agreement as well. What role has Iran factored into in terms of bringing some of these traditionally very um, combative areas and regions to, to working together? Well, the Americans and the Europeans have had the same goal with Iran, which is to deny them a nuclear weapon. We've had fundamentally different tactics. The Europeans want this watered-down consensus and status quo uh, dealing with Iran, the Americans, and specifically the Trump administration, has said, that doesn't work. We need to try something different. We've played a very tough uh, diplomatic game when it comes to Iran, and look what's happened. You have Sunni nations, you have Arab governments who are coming forward to say, let's, let's do something different. Let's sign these historic peace agreements. I will also just add quickly, it's the same issue with Kosovo, Serbia. We have economic normalization that has been uh, signed and yet this kind of old way of thinking, the UN way of thinking, the European way of thinking, was to continue pushing on the political front of Kosovo, Serbia. We've been banging our head against the wall for 20 years there. And so now we have economic normalization. We're quite pleased. Coming up, Joe Biden promises a return to international alliances if he is elected in November. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to this Bloomberg Television special, 2020 Year of Crisis, Diplomatic Divide. I'm Kevin Cirilli. From the Iran nuclear deal to the Paris Climate Accord, foreign policy in the Obama-Biden administration relied heavily on a multilateral approach, which has been largely rejected by the Trump White House. If elected, Joe Biden says he will return to those partnerships. Samantha Power served as the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations from 2013 to 2017 and she serves as an unofficial advisor for the Biden campaign. I think what you would see in a Biden administration where there's been uh, very little valuation of alliances under Trump is an effort to really rejuvenate uh, a US-centered alliance system in the world. And again, recognizing that that set of alliances, the community of democracies that exist, those who have shared values, that when we coordinate our actions together, we have way more leverage uh, in peace and security and way more uh, leverage in geoeconomics than we do when we act alone as we have been for, for too long in this administration. The administration and Republicans have argued that they were able to bring on board Bahrain, UAE, uh, in order to normalize relations with Israel as a result, in part because of the administration's positions and sanctions against the Iranian regime. Would you agree with that sentiment, or, or do you think there were other factors at play? Well, the Trump administration's logic in walking away from the Iran deal was that it would get a better deal. Instead, what we have now is Iran's breakout time uh, to a nuclear weapon uh, dramatically shrunk. Uh, apparently, reports now are that uh, Iran has 10 times uh, the amount of enriched material than it had when uh, Obama-Biden uh, handed the baton uh, to Trump and Pence. Uh, so within the four corners of Iran, I think no one can say uh, that the threat is contained. The United Nations, the World Health Organization, NATO, so many of these global order uh, institutions, these, these multilateral institutions, these uh, alliances, what emphasis would a Biden administration place on these uh, institutions uh, and how would that contrast with what we've seen with the current uh, president? 
Under a Biden administration, you would see the United States seeking to return to the catalytic role that it played uh, for three quarters of a century, basically since the Second World War. That catalytic role has been incredibly important, in, most recently in brokering the Iran nuclear deal, for example, by bringing countries, both our closest allies and countries that we have uh, great tension with, like Russia and China, to the same negotiating table to make Iran feel uh, isolated and to ensure uh, that it was prepared uh, to deal as it did. Uh, that catalytic role helped ensure that the United States led a global coalition uh, to end the Ebola epidemic before it became a pandemic with the kind of devastating impact that COVID has had up to this point. So if we look at these kinds of returns on the investment of U.S. leadership, we see what global bodies can be used for. Specifically with China, how would a Biden administration deal with Beijing? Well, it's going to be the most important and the most complex uh, relationship on planet Earth uh, for the foreseeable future, certainly as long as you and I are uh, on this Earth. And it's going to entail something that the Trump administration is not known for, which is nimbleness, uh, namely uh, nimbleness that ensures that there is the right mix of confrontation uh, on unfair trade practices, on human rights issues with China, uh, competition, again, getting our own house in order um, and rejuvenating America's economic strength so that we can compete uh, in, in favorable uh, circumstances internationally, that's going to be incredibly important. But also under a Biden administration, we have to recognize that on core global threats, uh, whether it's dealing with a pandemic or dealing with climate change, we have to be at the table with China forging an agreement in, in much the same way, way we did um, in the context of the Paris uh, Climate Agreement. We can't uh, it's turn our backs on something that will be the defining issue uh, of this century and uh, of uh, any presidency. It is going to prove the defining issue probably of the Trump presidency. In retrospect, people will look back and say, how did we walk away from a climate agreement and from domestic regulations to curb our emissions when the planet was burning up in this way? Uh, it will be the defining uh, issue for the next president and for every president thereafter. And to think that we can uh, sort of come up with an answer to climate change on our own without also pressing China, the world's largest emitter, which has made some headway domestically, but is still continuing to build coal plants as part of the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, that is wishful thinking. So collaboration as well as confrontation and competition and getting the mix right. Coming up, the U.S. and China find breaking up is hard to do. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to our special 2020 Year of Crisis Diplomatic Divide. I'm Kevin Cirilli. When the U.S. picks a president, the world watches. America's foreign policy partners keep a close eye on the campaign trail as they strategize how to proceed with U.S. relations after the election. For more on that international approach, I spoke with Daniel Mulhall, the Irish ambassador to the United States. From our point of view, I think the point of view of most countries, America is an essential uh, player in any international situation, the American role is always vital. Um, economically, from our point of view, we have an extraordinarily close relationship with the United States of two-way flows, very substantial two-way uh, flows of trade and investment uh, across the Atlantic. And um, those have been maintained uh, quite impressively during the pandemic, but clearly uh, we've lost economic uh, ground, America has lost economic ground, the world has lost economic ground, and it will be necessary for all of us to come together and to try and get back to where we were before this pandemic uh, hit us, and then to move on from there. In your time as a diplomat, and your career as a diplomat, how do people like yourself navigate changing government landscapes every four years in the United States uh, with when there are such contentious electoral buildups without having that certainty of an outcome? Well, you play the field as you find it. What I do is I, I look at the realities as they are and I try to find a way to navigate through this. So I've built up good relationships with uh, people in the Trump administration 
And if the administration changes, it will change anyway because the second Trump administration will be different from the first one. There'll be new people involved. A lot of the people that I know will probably move on and so on. So we'll have to anyway. And if it's a Biden administration, likewise, we have to start uh, making contacts there. We, we don't start from scratch because before the Trump administration came into office, we knew people in the, uh, that, that became part of the administration and they've become our, our uh, friends and, uh, and, and people we can contact and talk to within the administration. And likewise, the same will be true for the Biden administration, I, I would predict that there'll be a certain number of people whom we already know in that administration. There appears to be consensus still on how to deal with China. What role do you, sir, see the United States playing in the short term and long term in controlling China's aggressions? Well, our, our view and the view of most European countries um, um, on China is that we have to deal with China. We have to, to, to develop um, you know, our partnership with China, but without being in any way naive uh, as to um, the, you know, the challenges and the difficulties that uh, arise in relations with China because of the nature of that society and the nature of their economy and the way in which it's, it's run. So uh, in Ireland, for example, I think um, we, we, the vast bulk of the investment into Ireland comes from the United States. There is some Chinese investment. And we're now, our, our government now um, uh, has proposed a, uh, an investment screening um, piece of legislation which will um, give the government the power to, to examine um, proposals for investment in Ireland from not just from China but obviously China would uh, come up in this context and to enable us to make judgments as to whether that investment is in our overall interest or not. So I would say we're, 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 we, you know, we're hoping to be able to develop a positive relationship with China but we're, we're, we are in no way uh, naive about the challenges that that um, throws up. And we would like to see the United States and its European partners, the European Union, uh, working together and trying to, to figure out uh, a joint approach on how to deal with the changing circumstances in the global economy, which is not just to do with China, but has also got to do with the impact of the pandemic. And we, we do need to work together on this. We are, you know, we are stronger when we, uh, when we cooperate. The fact that um, one third of the world's GDP is embedded in the transatlantic trade, that 50% of the investment plus in both of our uh, areas comes from the other. So, you know, the United States is the biggest investor all over Europe. We're the, the EU is the biggest investor in the United States. We, for example, have investments of $120 billion in the United States. A small country like Ireland with 5 million people. The US has nearly $500 billion invested in Ireland. So, and that's the same. The same is true for many European countries. So, the idea that societies like ours, economies like ours, that are so intermeshed could have, could find themselves drifting into a form of trade, trade war. Now that we haven't reached that point obviously and I, I, I believe we'll never reach that point because the stakes are so high and the interest in getting a solution are so great. Uh, but we do need to sit down and, uh, and, and work through these things. As world alliances continue to shift, the U.S. and China remain the biggest trading partners on the planet. But amid a trade war, a global pandemic, and disputes over intellectual property and technology, the world's two largest economies seem at risk for a decoupling. In 2018, trade between the U.S. and China totaled more than $730 billion. But as President Trump imposed tariffs on $400 billion of Chinese imports, trade between the two countries shrank 15% in 2019 after years of steady increases. Even after the U.S. and China signed the Phase 1 trade deal in January, the tariffs stayed in place. They will likely stay there until a Phase 2 deal is signed, which is looking increasingly unlikely in the short term. China still needs to buy about $130 billion of goods in the second half of this year in order to comply with their promise of purchasing an additional $200 billion by the end of 2021. Despite that bigger trade freeze, U.S. oil exports to China are set to reach record levels. And 84% of U.S. companies surveyed said that they have no plans to move production or supply chain operations out of China. As the trade war continues, U.S. companies made $14 billion in long-term investments in China last year, which means that a quick, full U.S.-China decoupling remains unlikely in the short term. No matter what, 
The U.S.-China relationship will continue to dominate foreign policy conversations for years to come. For more on how the winner of the November election will shape this relationship, I spoke with Hagar Shamali, the CEO of Greenwich Media Strategies, and she has also served in both Republican and Democratic administrations at the Treasury Department and the United Nations. There's been a reshift in, in terms of our relationship, regardless of who wins in November. And, uh, I, you know, President Trump certainly brought that to the fore. And there, I, you know, based on a lot of my friends in the, in, who are advising Biden right now, I know that they intend to also approach China very carefully. Um, I do think the difference, like, like I said before, the difference is that they're going to try and do it with their allies versus go it alone. But as you said, the reshifting, and I think, by the way, that you're going to see reshifting in a number of ways, you know, Saudi Arabia is another one. But, um, but when it comes to China, we're going to see a focus on making sure that, uh, that China can't abuse anymore its relationship with the United States to enhance its own world you know, uh, position on the world stage and economic prowess. You know, what it's doing in Africa is a good example of that. The United States, you know, that China has been uh, in some kind of cold war, if you will, with our tech companies, with our government in terms of 5G, in terms of uh, establishing relationships new with other countries. They're trying to export their authoritarianism. So I think you're going to see the shift uh, continue, whether it's Biden who wins or not. Um, and uh, the only difference is that you're going to see allies included uh, or not. From your perspective, based upon your experience having served in both administrations, Republicans and Democrats alike, where do you see the U.S.-China relationship 10 and 20 years from now? Well, certainly this recalibration is going to make a difference, right? So, for example, when China was brought into the World Trade Organization, when it was given the most favored nation status, um, it was a very different scenario. And we did benefit at that time, right? I mean, the imports that we had from, from China allowed us to, uh, to expand our own economy. I mean, it was mutually beneficial is the point that I'm trying to make. And uh, that changed at a certain point, right? The balance was tipped and China started to abuse that. And we became very dependent on their economy for our own. Um, which is which is a mistake because, as we've seen now with how things have changed, we can go to other places for production. There, is, it, China's not the only one. Um, and furthermore, and more importantly, the more we contributed to China's economy, the more we ended up building this machine that was, as you said, uh, is is uh, pursuing human rights abuses. They feel empowered to go uh, cause problems in the South China Sea. There's certainly right now. Uh, feeling very strong in terms of affronting Hong Kong and Taiwan and 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 the list goes on, right? I mean, when it comes to uh, hacking Australia and pursuing skirmishes with India, I mean, so we have ended up we've built a China that is too strong for its own good, frankly. And what what I see in the next ten to twenty years, I mean, twenty is is, is far out, but but I do right now we are in this kind of cold war, and it boils down to a lot of issues. Uh, specifically when it comes to tech and 5G, right? And the race to be the power in, in, in bringing that to everybody, which is why the Trump administration has targeted Huawei and why that's been so important. Um, now, in 10 years, I would hope that by then that you do have a bit more of a recalibrated balance where we are not fueling this machine in China and perhaps where you have a different leader who may not want to or, or who at least may understand the value of international relationships and not pursue such nefarious behavior. That wraps up this special report, 2020 Year of Crisis, Diplomatic Divide. Be sure to tune in to Bloomberg Television and Radio for the latest information, news, and analysis 24 hours a day. I'm Kevin Cirilli. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.